final session of the morning, we'll be hearing from a panel of experts in relation to what's really happening with diversity and inclusion. When people talk about diversity, they're usually referring to the traits and characteristics that make people unique. You may as well be yourself because no one else can. While inclusion generally refers to the behaviours and social norms that ensure people feel welcome. What makes you different can include your point of view, your background, your ideas. Diverse teams of subject matter experts are able to deliver better outcomes for customers and communities. The human case for building fairer and more inclusive workplaces is hopefully beyond debate. Regardless of background, everyone deserves to work in a safe, supportive and respectful environment. There is also a vital business case for diversity and inclusion, which at its heart drives increased access to and active participation in the world of work from all parts of society across New Zealand. A diverse and inclusive workforce is one which takes in a variety of demographics and characteristics. To date, the focus has by and large been on gender, and while there remains work to be done, including addressing the gender pay gap, we need to consciously diversify diversity by looking beyond gender as well. Now I'd like to hand over to Miriama Davidson, journalist and broadcaster, who will be facilitating this important conversation to introduce our panel members and the amazing diversity and inclusion mahi being done at the FSC. Before getting the korero going, Miriama will first give a karakia. A huge thank you to sponsors AIA for this session. Welcome, Miriama. Kia ora te nā koutou katoa, ko te mea tūtahi me mihi ki tō tātou matua nui i te rangi, ko ia te timatanga, ko ia anō te mutunga. E raranga tira mā ki a koutou, ko a huihui mai ki go nei te ahuatanga o te rānei. Tēnā rā koutou katoa, ko Miriama Kamo, tō ko ingoa, ko kaitahu me ngā te mutunga o ku iwi. I ngā iwi o te mutu, tēnei te mihi nunui ki a koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā koutou katoa. No my haramai e te iwi ki tēnei whakawhiti kōrero, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Regenerations Conference session on diversity and inclusion. What is it? Why do we need it? Where can it take us? Uh, we can find some guidance in this conference's theme, he waka eke noa. Now, more than ever, we're in this together, rowing in the same direction, but with our various and different strengths. So I saw a wonderful analogy on the value of diversity and inclusion, which included a word I talk about a lot, equity. Michigan University's chief diversity officer uses a party analogy, and it goes like this. So diversity is where everyone is invited to the party. Equity means that everyone gets to contribute to the playlist, and inclusion means that everyone gets to dance. So in other words, everyone gets to dance when businesses prioritize DNI, and this in turn creates a more profitable company and who wouldn't want that? He waka eke noa. So we're going to talk about this and more with our panel of speakers, each of whom I admire. Uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing from them, Dame Valerie Adams, uh, Teresa Gatting and David Tikal, who we'll meet properly in just a moment. Suatahi, a big mihi to our conference sponsors, particularly AIA for sponsoring this session. But I would like to ask David to kick us off with a kaya, uh, karakia. Kei a koe, e te whanaina. Morena e tana ka Mariama, morena kōrua ngā tohu kai rangi, Teresa Roa ko Valerie, nau mai tauti mai ki tā tātou hui topo. Nō rei rā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa, ko tā tātou karakia. Uh, whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, kia mā kina kina te ki uta, kia mā tāra tāra ki tai. E hi yaki ana te atakura, he teo, he hoka, he hauhu, te hei mauriora. Kia ora. Kia ora. It's my pleasure now to introduce the co chairs of the Financial Services Council DNI Committee, Tracy Cross and Christy Redfern. Hi, I'm Christy. New Zealand is such a rich, diverse culture, and we have an opportunity to embrace that and turn diversity and inclusion into an asset at the Financial Services Council. We need to ensure everyone is safe to bring their whole self to the sector, knowing they won't be discriminated against, and diversity of thought really is a strength. 
DNI in the financial services industry requires more commitment and focus than what it's getting. The FSC plays a critical role here in leadership, and we're looking to lead and achieve this for the benefit of our customers, employees, stakeholders, and the wider community. Hi, I'm Tracy. Diversity and inclusion is critical to our industry. An inclusive environment means equitable access to resources, to talent, and to opportunities for all to participate and be heard. This in turn leads to innovation, better decision making, um, overall product productivity uplifts, and why on earth would we not want that? We must include and reflect the diverse society in which we operate. A more diverse and inclusive profession will ultimately shape better financial outcomes for all Kiwis, as well as building a stronger future for the financial services industry. We have lots of exciting initiatives ahead, and we look forward to you joining us on this journey, a journey which has already commenced with our It Starts With Action campaign. Be empowered to tell your stories. If you can see it, you can be it. Take action and be that inspiration for a tamariki. And I'm here with my daughter to celebrate the launch of the FSC DNI initiative. I will start by actively supporting diversity and inclusion with my managers. I will start by not judging people by their age. Kia ora. I will start by greeting everybody in the morning and today. I will start by promoting a culture of trust and flexibility. I will start by adopting a more flexible approach for working parents. I will start by encouraging my colleagues to recognise that we're stronger together. I will start by modelling inclusive language. I will start by listening and giving everyone the chance to have a voice. We all have a voice. Encouraging others to speak up to make impactful change. I will start by encouraging everyone to get involved. Yes, yeah, so some really great ideas about how to start the process of meaningful diversity and inclusion there from modelling inclusive language to encouraging everyone to get involved, which is what we want to see happen, but how and why. Uh, here to give us their perspectives and our three individuals from very diverse backgrounds and worldviews. Uh, it's our great pleasure to spend this hour with them to mine their depth of experience, their wisdoms and insights and what they know about the importance of diversity and inclusion in everything. So let's start by introducing the inimitable Dame Valerie Adams. She's undoubtedly the most dominant uh, track and field star New Zealand has ever produced. Back-to-back -back Olympic golds at the 2008 and 2012 Games, a silver in 2016, a bronze at Tokyo 2020, and four world championship titles. Dame Valerie just keeps winning and making the country proud. Now a mother of two, <laughs> Dame Valerie also made a foray into coaching when she assisted younger sister Lisa to a gold medal win at Tokyo 2020's Paralympics in the shot put. In 2016, Valerie was made a dame. She's a leader and role model in the Pacific community and seven-time Hellberg Sportswoman of the Year. So well, welcome, Dame Val. Uh, Lord knows how you've juggled it all with two wee ones in the background too. Amazing. Lovely to see you. Our next panellist is Teresa Gatting. Uh, she's a New Zealand business leader, entrepreneur, author, philanthropist and investor. She was the first female CEO of an NZX listed company, Telecom, and since leaving there, has divided her time between professional governance, entrepreneurial projects and philanthropic work. She's held multiple governance positions and holds a number of chairpersonships, including AIA New Zealand. She's co-founder of My Food Bag, the New Zealand leader CEO, and this year funded the Teresa Gatting Chair of Women in Entrepreneurship at Auckland University's Business School. Teresa is a companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to business and philanthropy. And in July, she was inducted into the New Zealand Hall of Fame for Women Entrepreneurs. Now, I hasten to say this is just a few wee pickings from the exceedingly long list of achievements and endeavours that Teresa Gatting uh, manages. There's got to be a secret to it. Hopefully, we'll get to it in this session. 
And then, of course, David Tierkyle. David was, of course, this morning's Kaikara uh, Kia. He's the Executive Director of Fairoa, an investment scheme for Ngaitahu Whanau, which manages over 120 million for over 30,000 members. He's worked there since 2011. Before that, David worked in the finance and banking sectors in London for 20 years, holding positions at RBS, NatWest, and HSBC banks before returning to Aotearoa. Since 2012, David's been a director of the Puho Tamatia Limited, a holdings company of the Hapu or Ngati Feke, and was a trustee of Aarapaki Marae from 2013 to 2016. David has a Master's of Business Administration from Massey University and is currently a PhD student at the University of Canterbury, where he's researching how Ngaitahui we effectively shares the proceeds of its Treaty of Waitangi settlement with tribal members. Um, and for those of you that don't know, David and I are from the same Marae, Rāpaki, undoubtedly the most beautiful Marae in the country, eh, David? Kia ora. <laughs> so to all of you, uh, among the things that we're going to discuss in this session are what is DNI? Why is it not just a nice to have? Why is it a must have? How can it create both healthy and wealthy organizations? What are the barriers to getting there? And how do we overcome this? So some of the issues that we'll look to touch on are the business case for DNI, the gender pay gap, why closing it makes good business sense, DNI in sports and how to strategize for it. Why te reo inclusion and casting a treaty lens across your organization is important, how promoting all minority communities is uh, needed, and how to identify your own unconscious bias and challenge that. So I'd like to start, if I may, with the question to um, you, Dame Valerie Adams. What does DNI mean to you? Uh, this subject is actually quite important to me. Um, for me, um, this is understanding and acknowledging that each person is unique and different, like myself, <laughs> and for us to embrace every individual with no judgment, right? So that's sometimes quite hard to do. Um, for me in the sporting world, when I started athletics, I was one of only two Polynesians or two brown faces. And athletics was a sport that was quite, um, you know, run by a very uh, Caucasian organization, which which was the norm. It was lots of middle distance runners. Um, they all came from quite um, well sorted backgrounds. I came from a very low socioeconomic background with no money. Athletics was something that was not popular in South Auckland or where I come from, it was rugby and netball. So when I first came into the sport, it was quite intimidating. It was very, um, I was very shy. I'm six foot four, but I wanted to be five foot two. I'm sorry for anybody who's five foot two and is still five foot two. <laughs> um, but it was one that I had to really uh, work hard to find my feet to find my confidence to feel normal and feel uh, just like the rest of them. But it hasn't always been like that, right? And throughout my career and with success, it became a little bit easier, but that was only because I was successful. So I felt more um, empowered by that success to then bring my culture into a world where they didn't see what Polynesia was, was all about. So I used that to the best of my ability and I still, still do to this day. And it's wonderful for me to see so much more uh, youth and athletes of every color, every gender, like gender, um, come through and participate in a sport in a sport which didn't see a lot um, when I first started. So I was pretty um, empowered, but also um, wanted to, to make and have this difference within our sport. I'm now a parent of two little courageous toddlers and both of them are of uh, Cook Island, Tongan and English background. So me as a parent, I try to empower them to embrace their culture, embrace the fact that they do be, come from these amazing uh, backgrounds and I want them to embrace it with no judgment later on. And that's including language, that's including where they from, wearing their um, outfits from, where, where we come from. And it's, it's one that I have taken upon myself and taking that responsibility to, to make sure we do that. And um, because we live here in New Zealand and we don't have the opportunity to live in the islands, we have to, to make sure that we go above and, be, and beyond. And I have a little story uh, to, to, to kind of um, end my answer to this question. My mother-in-law, my father-in-law came and immigrated to New Zealand and they both speak Tongan and they had decided not to speak Tongan to their children because they wanted them to um, embrace the New Zealand culture and not get judged or picked on by their schoolmates if they knew Tongan. 
and including my husband and that really broke my heart because my husband doesn't speak a drop of Tongan and we go back to Tonga and he has no korero or uh, talano with his grandma who is still alive so I'm sitting here translating between him and his grandmother and I feel really sad my heart breaks for him so much but that was the choice that his parents made to protect their children so I don't want that for, for my kids and it's our job now to try and change that thinking and, and change that, that way um, that say our our mums and dads thought like you know this was the best way for our children thank yeah you. thank you so much for sharing that story and I think it's just so very important it resonates for me absolutely because uh in the the desire to to be like everyone else uh and and also in our history where we have been forced to be like everyone else uh you know we we lose that diversity we lose the notion of inclusion and we lose the notion of being stronger together and you are a perfect example of somebody who um stepped into your diversity and difference and um brought courage and strength to that to that, and to the benefit of our country. You stepped into your height, into your uh, long reach, into your beautiful um, ahua, and, uh, and just the, the, the face that you've presented to the world has been just so incredibly, uh, you know, useful and valuable and needed for us as a country. So thank you, Dame Valerie. I'd like to put the same question to you, Teresa Gatting. What is um, DNI to you? Well, kia ora wahine mai, tane mai. It's been a really long nahu, rahui lockdown for some of us, and it's great to be with you here today. Um, look, it's it's about difference, whether that's gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, geography, disability. It's embracing all of it. It's embracing all of it. And it's doing that at a personal level. And, and the word has already been said about not making judgments. It's doing it at a personal level. It's doing it at an organisational level. I don't know any organisation I'm involved with currently that is not in an authentic conversation about how do they do this. And finally, it's actually about embracing it at a national level so that New Zealand can lead the world. You know, we, we can lead the world in this and we, we're not going to survive and thrive individually, as a family, as a country, and in our companies and all our organisations, unless we do. So I think it's big. It's a really, really important korero. Well, let me ask you about that. What does it look like to lead the world in this space? Well, what it looks like to lead the world in the space is to actually be up for transparent, honest conversations about it. It's actually quite hard. We all have unconscious bias about different things, perhaps all of those things. It's very easy for me to think about you know, what a farm is like, for example, or to not see people who are in a wheelchair and assume that, you know, just to not think about accessibility to events for, for people who've got disabilities. It's, uh, I tend to see sexism. I look at the world through a gender lens, so I see sexism. But, you know, do I check my own potential racism? I'm trying really hard, but, you know, it's you, we, we still do. If I see a woman in a hijab, I'm likely to think you're oppressed. I'm not likely to think you've made a conscious choice to do this as a symbol of who you are at a deep and core and fundamental level. So all of us have challenges in this area. And so it's having an honest conversation about that. And it's to look at the systematic issues and all the companies and organizations we're part of to do this better, because that will create a huge shift. That is that is really courageous. Thank you, Teresa Gatting. You know, the, the courage to step into your unconscious bias. Uh, David, what are your thoughts about that? What's DNI to you and, and how do you step into that unconscious bias? Sure. Yeah, it's um it, it's it's not actually a, a tricky one for me. Um the, the ten years that I've worked at Tedunangor or Naitahu, um, my board chair has been um, a Wahine. So that started off with uh, Dame Diana Crossan. Um, our next uh, board chair was Kristen Kohiri Suta, the, the chair of Mercer Investments New Zealand, um, and currently uh, Fiona Pym. So um, I, I've been working for uh, Wahine in senior governance positions um, for, for many years, um, which was um, quite quite different from coming out of the, the banking sector in the UK, which um, at that stage was, was still um, a bit behind, I think, where we are today in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, and you know that that's not even taking into account our, our Teru Nangaro Naitahu CEO, um, who who is Arahia Bennett, and uh, you know so we we have some uh, amazing uh, sort of diversity in our senior governance and leadership positions at at the workplace. 
Um, I really think that if you if it's around you every day, and I heard Dame Valerie talk about normalisation before, um, and you know, and it's normalised, then uh, that's that's to not just um, talking the talk, but walking the walk of of actually seeing this in action. So it's it's um, it's really encouraging. I think that you know, financial services we've we've still got a wee way to go. When you walk into the conference at um, Financial Services Council, it's getting better. I love what what Richard and the team are doing at Financial Services Council, and I think that you know we're we're ready to to really uh, uh, make this make some change. It's been, it's been a long time coming in the sector, hasn't it? Why do you think that is? Yeah, it's um it, it's it's a great point. You know, um, I think as well when when you. It's really easy to, to blame uh, the, the old boys club um, and, uh, you know, change is, is hard. And uh, sometimes, you know, that, that top down uh, needs to come across all the, the, the areas that, that um, Teresa talked about before. Um, it's not just diversity. It's not just being, you know, shoulder tapped for, for senior positions on boards. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm happy to see that I think there is change um, happening. Um, it's just maybe not quick enough, um, Mariama, and you know maybe there's there's more that we can do as individuals, as leaders, to be able to to um, speed this up. What what would you do, Teresa, to speed things up? First of all, for all of those out there who are corporates, come and become a partner of Global Women. We have got a committed group of about fifty companies, and we have work streams in gender diversity and in building inclusive cultures and ethnic diversity led by champions, the CEOs, of those organizations supported by the chief people officers and supported by us. And so you can learn and share in the spirit of one beggar showing another where to find food. You don't have to do it yourself. There are so, you know, so come and be part of the, the, the momentum of the, of the leaders in this area. That's the first thing. The second thing is, you know, start a conversation, exec team levels, if that's where you're at. Look around the room. Is it a diverse group? Are you met, Are you bringing through women and men of colour and of different backgrounds? Or are you thinking of leadership in a tall, white, male way, which has been historically how we've thought about as our leaders show up? If, if, you, are ha if you are a governor in an organisation, have those conversations with the rest of the board. So wherever you are, start wherever you are. What's the business case for DNI, Teresa? Why do we want to do this? Oh, oh the um, the best, the top consulting firms in the world have looked at this a lot in the last five years, and each time they look at it, they conclude that they understated the benefits first time round. Doesn't matter whether you look at boards. It doesn't matter whether you look at investment fund manager performance. Doesn't matter if you look at executive teams. All the studies show that mixed gender usually has been just gender that's been researched in the last five years performs better. It's not even an opinion anymore. That's like a fact. It's, it's funny that it's moving so slowly then, isn't it? Because I, I saw this um, uh, one statistic, the Boston Consulting Group study that found that companies with the more diverse management teams have 19% higher revenues due to innovation. So it's not just a, a nice to have, it's a must have, a money making must have. And there's a roughly 20% innovation revenue gap between companies that have below average diversity scores and those above average. 20%, that's huge. Why would you want to ignore it? Well, I think it is coming a bit, a bit faster now. We're starting to see funds investing only in female founders, for example. Ice House Ventures did one last year, they're working on a bigger one now. Other firms are coming to New Zealand with that approach. And BCG was who I was talking about. When they looked at it the second time, which is the study you're quoting, they concluded it was even more powerful than when I looked at it previously. So... It is actually building up ahead of momentum, but at the end of the day, it's us. It starts with us saying where we are is not good enough and being intentional about doing something about it. So, Dame Valerie, where do you see the balance lying? So, you know, for me in, um, in TV, I've never felt more like I belong. And I've been in, t in TV for 20-something years now. Um, and, and, and now that I'm recognising how much diversity, mindful diversity and inclusion is going on in my industry, I've realised how much I didn't actually felt, feel like I belong all that time. Does that resonate for you? Absolutely. In the sporting world, I think we've come a long way. I mean, it just goes to uh, is having the courage to open up these conversations and actually acknowledging that there is 
a, you know, a lack of diversity within the system. Um, when they're used to this system, to a white male who leads this um, high performance sport, for example, that's just the norm. That's what we're used to. And that's what I grew up with. And in fact, like the biggest um, like celebration for me within high performance system was actually when, when Raylan Castle got hired to replace our... Um, our CEO and I just thought that was just the most amazing thing it's the first time we've had, we have had a female in that role I feel like she's going to bring so much more to within the sport but I think I also feel like she will understand more now for us in the sporting industry me personally as a mum now it's actually how can I use that platform to, to make people see that for athletes who want to become mums actually being open-minded to that and working together with someone in power to help um, implement you know some some opinions or some thoughts that we have to try and help the sport in general with there is now a diversity and inclusion group within high performance sport there is a massive push to try and um, have te reo classes so people have the opportunity to uh, learn te reo also greet people in, in, in te reo and there are more and more staff members who are actually putting this into practice I'm Tongan I speak fluent Tongan and I love the fact that I can do that and I catch people off because I don't look for Tongan, they just actually assume I'm Māori, but when I start blurting out in Tongan after they've just talked about me, it's the best thing ever and the best feeling ever, but I totally like embrace that that part of me wholeheartedly and I am actually grateful for my mother um, for teaching me Tongan when I was younger, but within the sporting world itself, we still have a lot of work to do. However, we're like we're on that path to a better system within the sport. So again, I'm quite a big, unique uh, person within the sport. I'm going to try and use that to have a positive impact within um, the sporting organization. Now, at the Olympics, factual, uh, majority of the medals were won by females. So that in itself <laughs> should be a celebration because um, it's something that that wasn't the case a, a while ago. So for us, it is the small wins. It's having those uh, courageous and open conversations that are honest and transparent with no judgment. Sometimes, as Teresa said, it's actually quite hard to do that. But how can we as individuals um, use our position to empower that or, or to start those conversations and awkward conversations, but they need to be had? Yeah, need to be had courageously, as you say. Um, so I'm just going to pause very momentarily just to remind everybody here watching that you can ask questions. I'm not sure that I mentioned that at the beginning of our discussion, but you can um, do that in the chat um, column. You can ask our panellists anything that you like. Um, David, let me come to you. Um, Dame Valerie mentioned you know, that, that many organisations are going on the Te um, journey. Why is it important for us to, um, to cast a treaty lens across our organisations? Children, me, I mean, and uh, you know that that's. Um, I'm not sure if I'm the right person to, to answer that one. Um, you know, at, at Te Rungaroa or Naitahu, we, we've been uh, knee deep in in treaty uh, claims for uh, you know uh, hundreds of years, and uh, so you know that that's um, or that's that's something that that you know we we do um, as a as um, an everyday daily discipline. Um, but um, on, on the back of that, I think that, you know, the, the importance is that um, everybody needs to, to make a start somewhere. Um, and, you know, if I was to, to talk about the, uh, the, the broadcasting industry, um, it, it absolutely kills me when I hear a broadcaster talking, or actually a commentator, and, and pronouncing Taranaki as Taranaki. I think that, you know, these little basics are, um, you know, we... Um, Māori don't walk around mispronouncing Pākehā names, um, you know, at the drop of a hat through, through um, ignorance or, or whatever you want to, to put a blame on it. Um, and I think that there is the, the movement that is now coming through our schools that we didn't have when we were uh, our, you know, tamariki ourselves, the movement for our, our tamariki to be able to learn te reo, to be able to get their pronunciation right, it's uh, just amazing. You know, the, the conference, um, the last time we got together as a conference for Financial Services Council, uh, yes. the, the team opened with um, a kapahaka performance from uh, Richard's uh, daughter's school, uh, which was amazing. You know, you, you, you just see that it's not tokenism, it's, it's a real flavour to, to make change, to move forward. Um, Absolutely. We've all yeah. got a place to start. 
I think there's a there's a nice notion of um, of, of recognizing Te Reo as as our language of this country, and it makes us unique in the world, and that in itself is something that should be celebrated and um, and you know taken up. You know, take up those opportunities to learn. It seems so odd to me that after all this time of living together um, as a you know as as a number of different peoples in this country, that we do still have people struggling with it with the Reo and the pronunciation of it, but. David, this may give you some um, uh, comfort that I do know in our industry, particularly in broadcasting, there is a real and authentic and genuine um, engagement with uh, Te Reo and ensuring that not only is it pronounced correctly, but it's used and shared. And, and I see that across a lot of different broadcasting organizations and, um, and across journalism generally, which brings me to such a wonderful sense of belonging and... Um, and, yeah, and comfort. Yeah. Um, Dame uh, Valerie, so you mentioned Te Reo and you talked about your pride and your um, Tongan heritage. Well, tell me a, a bit more about the Reo side of things, though, and, and why it's important um, for you to, to have, a, have a, a learning and understanding uh, and appreciation of it. It's for, for me, it's to keep the culture alive. Um, it really is to keep the culture alive. Here in, and unfortunately, here in New Zealand, there's a lot of... Uh, youth or, or people my age who actually don't know their, their culture, don't know where they come from, don't know um, there are certain traditions to follow, you know, all of those things like you would have on the marae. We have, you know, the, the Tongan have their own uh, traditions that they must follow. The language for me is a, is, is, is a big one. And when you have full-blown Tongans who actually cannot speak the, the language, it's quite sad. I find it quite sad for them. And they grow up later wanting to learn it, but at the time they have no interest in learning it because um, for one reason or another, they just it, it just doesn't happen. And then they grow up and almost um, almost regret it. Now, I'm only half Tongan. My other half is English, but I was brought up the Tongan way. So anything Tongan, you ask me, I got your back. I got your back. And I know what happens at weddings, tangies, uh, baptisms, christening, the, the whole thing. And it's awesome because it's a great representation of how my mum educated me when I was younger and just how staunch she was in making sure that we, her, her girls, knew exactly what to do when it was time to do it, and especially in family functions, because you know all the aunties want to have a good look and make sure her girls knew exactly what to do. We all know the, the aunties. So um, for me, that's so important. Now, on to my kid, uh, to my daughter, who's only four, I have to make sure she knows what's up and she knows her role within the family. And the, the important thing for me is making sure that she knows because now her tongue and bloodline has diminished a little bit because now she's like she's Cook Island, she's English and she's Tongan. So I've got to make sure I push my Tongan side as much as possible so she knows exactly what's going on. So then she can pass it on to her children. It's slowly, like my generation in particular and the one younger, it's slowly kind of diminishing as, as we are here in Aotearoa. But we have that responsibility. We have to do our bit as much as we can. And that's why we never have the opportunity to speak to, to, the, to the youth, the Tongan youth online, whether it's online or, or in person, or to speak my language to them. They get a surprise by that, but you can also see a hint of embarrassment from them because here's me. Half and half speak, speaking the uh, our, our mother tongue, and them full, it does put them a little bit in their place. But it's not about embarrass like shaming them or anything. It's actually talking to them and making sure that I'm in by I embrace it as much as possible, but empower them to do the same. So I would like you know give them some few um, lighter uh, words in tongue, and so they they do understand something. So there is a, a conversation, but it, it's so important, Miriam. I just I cannot stress it enough. Uh, my house underneath my beds have, have all those mats like a typical Tongan. You wouldn't actually think that. Uh, my medals take a second um, second class uh, seat where all my Tongan stuff pretty much takes pride in my household. I love it. I think, you know, what I'm hearing you say is that you, you step fully into who you are and that you allow others um, by being that to do, to do that also. Um, Teresa Gatting, I'd like to come to you to talk about the gender pay, back, uh, pay gap, rather. So um, Dame Valerie mentioned before that uh, most of the medals at the Olympics are won by women. Um, we had, until recently, we had a female prime minister and female leader of the opposition. But we have a 9% gender pay gap in New Zealand. Women earn roughly $26 per hour and men 29. We need to change this quickly. This is really fascinating to me. It's been estimated that closing the gender gap would add, would add $28 trillion 
to the value of the global economy which is by 2025. So that's a 20, 26% increase. So companies and societies succeed and grow when women do, right? Yes. Yeah, we do. We've had a 9% gender pay gap now for years, for many, many years. It hasn't shifted. And that's white woman, Pakeha woman. It's 14% for Wahini Māori, and it's over 20% for Pacifica women. And, of course, the factors are complex. Occupational segregation, that women tend to congregate in areas that are not well paid, perhaps because they're full of women. Um, women don't tend to get promoted. Women take time out for raising children. There are many reasons for it. But again, it comes back to intentionally wanting to do something about it. So um, this government has a fair, pr fair pay agreements going through, looking at nurses and wood midwives and similar occupational categories that are female oriented and saying, well, the skills required for this, what does that look like? And in a male, in a, in a, in a sector that's mainly men, and are we paying fairly? And there's about 15 of those lined up to go through in the next couple of years. So that will make a difference. Looking at it in the sector, Within companies, again, it actually goes, are we paying our women fairly? Oh, how are we thinking about leadership? And, and there's a little bit on women to negotiate, to speak up, to just ask. I don't want to say, you know, just lean in. It's not all about women's responsibility. But there is, but, but nor are we victims either. You know, it's one of those things that we have, we, we have power as well. Um, uh, I think the first thing we should do, though, is report on the gap. Australia and the UK have mandatory gender pay gap reporting, and it's very difficult to fix something if you can't see it, you can't measure progress. And so, as I mentioned before, the Global Women Partners, who are called Champions of Change, we are, some of them are voluntarily doing gender pay gap reporting at the moment. Warehouse does it, Spark, Westpac, uh, Sky City, Genesis. So there's a handful of big companies that are doing it, and they're not all... They're not all top of the pops either. They're doing it. They're owning it. We've got programs in place to shift it, all sorts of different programs. We're working with all the champions to do gender pay gap reporting Q1 next year. So reporting it is the very first thing that companies should be doing. On a mandatory basis. What about needing, um, uh, you talked about plans. So do we need a detailed plan, a strategy, not just a, a you know, moral obligation to advance women? Do we need yes. to really be thinking about a strategy? Yes. Well, the Minister of Women's Affairs, Minister for Women is working on a Women's Employment Action Plan to go to Cabinet, for Cabinet to embrace it. So that's at a political level. At a business level, yes. And each organisation is different. You know, Air New Zealand has a different issue with pilots who've tended in the past to be male and cabin crew tend to be female. So the way that they would be dealing with it, and they've really been at the forefront of this for a long time, is very different from another situation you say, say an energy company might be dealing with it. So each company has different challenges, but but can learn from others. Doesn't have to be in their industry. Can learn from others in terms of what's worked, and we can also learn from companies overseas. Um, and Wednesday, for example, we've got Pat Marlow, who's the CEO of Salesforce for Australia and New Zealand, speaking at the Champion Summit. And Salesforce is a leading company in this whole area, not just gender. Um, you know, they are. They provide support packages for people who want to transition, for staff members who want to transition. I mean, that's right out there in terms of embracing diversity. So um, there's plenty of ability to learn from others who are doing it and to work in a genuine leadership way to figure out what are the particular issues. Is it a participation gap or is it a power gap that are holding women back in your particular company? What are your thoughts on this, David? Yeah, great question. Um, uh, uh, you know, you, you as I was talking before, you know, there's definitely not a um, capacity issue or capability issue when you look out into our our financial services industry. We we do have some amazing leaders that are coming through um, in in the diversity channels and not just uh, the the white um, pale male stale um, uh, area that that's been talked about in the past. Um, so I'm actually quite encouraged about that. Um, you know, we, we're, it's just not quick enough is, is one of the the, um, the keys, I think. And, and uh, you know, how we, we do that is to use um, ourselves as leaders in order to be able to um, enforce some change. Um, you know, is it, is it time to, to start talking about, I mean, it's not a great word to use, but, but the quota, um, you know, do we need to talk about this? Is, there, is this going to be one way for us to be able to, to help to speed things up? I think that's a question for, for the other panellists as well. 
Uh, yeah, I think that's a really interesting one. I mean, we see um, recently Christopher Luxon, new National Party leader, saying, you know, don't expect a diverse front bench. We had a poor election result and, um, and this is the outcome of that. Well, arguably... Uh, in fact, Judith Collins had commissioned a report on that poor election result, and one of the recommendations that came out of that report was have a plan for diversity, and the response was, well, we don't want quotas. What are your thoughts on quotas, Dame Valerie? Oh, uh, it shouldn't actually be a thing. Yeah. Um, like, so, like so I think it, it's catch-22 because you want the right people in there to, to, to do the job. Um, but it's, it, it is also acknowledging that um, that DNI is uh, spoken about. This I mean, in a different way, because we, we talked about strategizing, didn't we? And, and, you know, I think quota is potentially quite an emotive word, but it gets away from the notion that actually if you strategize, uh, then you can you can fix the whole question of whether you have a quota or not. Do you think that that's the way that we should be looking at it, um, Dame Valerie? Is to, let's have a strategy. Let's look right back to the beginnings of our organisation and see where you know I don't know to do a little audit of of how we came to be who we are and a roadmap for how we go forward. Absolutely, that that's probably a better way to to, to look at things is actually to have a plan in place so that. You know things that was normal in the past. Be, we can make those changes because um, it's difficult. Because, but I can only speak from my own experiences, and and basically along the way is actually how do we open up the doors to get the right people in, but also open up the doors wider than what we look at, right? So you can see, okay, we can only get X amount of coaches from this side of the bridge, but in fact, we actually need to open up our doors wider, and who can we pick out of this group that could impact, have a positive impact within our sport, but empower them to do so. And it's, um, Tracy says, uh, Teresa says something earlier about um, how do females have the courage to speak up? Now, there are some industries which where, uh, for example, Pacific Islanders or Maoris or people of color be quite um, intimidated to speak up because they might say the wrong thing or, or, or do the wrong thing. They could have a, a negative um, impact on their uh, resume or their interview or anything like that actually no we we know there are great people out there maybe we turn around and we go search for them instead of them coming to us and that could be a way of bringing the right people in and making sure that um, it covers all bases now it's for me within my own sporting world the coaching system for example has opened up to many people of many color uh, of of, of, of all colors, um, for example, it's not just the typical palangi who takes up those positions, but that's just the Athletics New Zealand, for example, going out to reach out to these people and to the communities. So they work within the communities to empower them, to give them the knowledge, uh, the education, and then gave them the opportunity to come to Athletics New Zealand mm -hmm. to get those coaching roles. That's how we did it within our sport, and it seems to work. And we continue to work within that system to empower those in the community to come to us instead of waiting for them to come to us. doesn't quite work in all industries, but it might be something that um, we got to probably look for, like look um, more in depth into to, I guess, get more people into those positions. You know, I'd argue that it would work in every industry that you go out and you search and you look. I think that's a fantastic way to look at it. Um, Sport NZ suggested a good way to think about diversity is to think about your local community. Does your organisation reflect the diversity of your local community? And I hear that from you, um, Dame Valerie. Um, you know, diversity is the mix of people. Inclusion is trying to get all those people mixed in harmony. I mean, do you think that's the answer Teresa getting is to is to go out or to look at your local community and to go out and actively uh, support um, engagement? Well, I certainly think the answer is to be intentional. And there are organizations like Tupu Toa in which you can go and get graduates who are not who are not white. You can actually, you know, say, look, we want to actually, we've got to bring on quite a lot to try and, you know, level the playing field. So there are people that you can work with that I've already put in the plug for Global Woman. You can work with us. However, I used to be against quotas and I'm now more open to it. And I'm sitting here wondering, because progress has been so slow, well, we're having, from next year onwards, companies have to do mandatory climate change reporting. So it's going to be mandatory for all large companies, large fund managers, NZX companies, etc. Why a woman 
or Māori or Pacifica less important than that? Why is it okay? I don't see people protesting about mandatory climate change reporting because we've got to a point in our consciousness and we realise actually collectively we need to shift the dial in a major way. So we're doing something about it. We'll be one of the first countries in the world to do this. You know, we're, we're nowhere near one of the first. If, if we were to legislate for inclusion on gender, we, were, we would be nowhere near the first. You know, Scandinavia did that years ago, 2013. There's seven, eight years worth of data showing that it works. So we're, we're slow in this area. It's not, it's not world-breaking. Now, if we were to legislate for ethnicity on boards, or that would be world-leading. No one else is doing that. But that's what I meant before about we need an intersectional approach on this, you know, a way of doing it that actually isn't going, well, gender is different from this, it's different from that. It actually does it in a way that does end up with more, with more DNI and and no, no bad unintended consequences. So I'm open to whether it is time I don't, I don't want to use the word quota. I'm open to whether it is time for some legislative framework intervention. I don't rule that out, but it's important it's done when the tide is rising. If you do it too soon, you just get backlash. If you do it as that when the tide is rising, like the, as I think is happening with climate change, you, you can do it and it will accelerate things because people of goodwill are already moving in that direction. There's always going to be laggards. So I do wonder whether, in fact, 22 is the time. Once we come out of lockdown fatigues, not now, not right now, but it should be on, Omicron doesn't, you know, send us all back into our rooms to have a think about things next year. Um, I wonder whether next year is the time for this corridor myself. This is so interesting. Can we legislate for DNI, David, your thoughts. Well, we've got a, a regulator who's um, not not shy in coming forward and on the and you know and that the climate related disclosures um, issues have been debated for for some time. But um, yeah, I think that we um, you know we with that we do have a regulator and a you know companies um, and, and entities like Financial Services Council that that are moving in the right direction and would be supportive of of these. So yeah, I'd love to have, certainly have the the discussions furthered and, um, and you know and the question really is is not about um, should we do it but how can we do it yeah this is a fascinating one so Teresa Gatting what might the legislation be well it might say a minimum on boards of 40 percent women and a minimum of 40 percent men so you can always have the natural you know, when, when you go to quotas, people immediately go, oh, that means 50%. Well, don't be so binary about it. You know, we're, it's life. People are retiring, resigning, moving on, etc. So it might look like 40% women, 40% men. And it might look like on, the, on a board, 20% diverse ethnicity, disability, sexual orientation, and you can be counted twice, right? If you're a Wahini Māori, you're 40% woman and you're 20% diverse. And it might actually go, that's it. You know, it, that is that becomes part of the ESG governance. We've got climate change reporting, we've got that. And it might look like many, many years transition to get there. There needs to be consequences. So there would need to be a penalty of some sort. Um, but there needs to be a long time frame to get there so that people can get there with the programs they're already running, but will really put a bomb onto those programs because they'll know that there's a consequence if they don't. And my answer to why finance has been so slow, quite frankly, is because actually this is an industry that's about money. Money is, the, you know, money is really at the heart of it. And I think some of those companies that are facing the consumers and selling them fast and the consumer goods have been quicker. Look at all the... So you look at all the stuff the warehouse is doing at the moment, has been doing, you know, so some of the companies that are actually interfacing more directly with the consumer in a very um, intimate way have actually got on this faster. So that's just my view that we've been a bit slow as an industry because we haven't felt the pressure from consumers to be different. Ah, that's interesting. That's interesting. It's interesting too about the, you know, the, the notion of money and people, I guess, seeing risk in, in changing things. But what, how can you argue with a $28 trillion addition to the value of the global economy? We're closing the gender pay gap. That's incredible. Um, I can hear people, though, saying as they listen to you, Teresa, saying, yeah, best person for the job. Come on. Yeah, merit is the, merit is the bottom line for all roles. There's no doubt about that. And just looking back to what you said, 
many of the banks have now got female CEOs, right? So actually we have seen this shift. Um, anyway, the start of it, not the, no, not the full panorama of it. Um, it's always merit. But the traditional lens on merit has been narrow. So that's the point. It's not that we're moving away from merit. It's merit, but it's a, that's why I like the word embracing. It's actually looking at that in a broader way because um, Val was talking before about something that's really important, cultural competency. Cultural competency is part of merit. If you're involved in a company that's selling to the diversity that is New Zealand, Auckland is an Asian city. You know, it's like it's so uh, cultural competency is ought to be seen as a skill and it, and it traditionally hasn't been, increasing now maybe it is. And so it's the lens that you put on merit that matters. Oh, yes, I like that. And what, what, are, you, what are your thoughts about that, Dame Valerie? Um, well, I agree with everything that Teresa just mentioned. Um, I, it does come down to merit, um, definitely. I just... <laughs> The community thing is, is, is still quite a strong part of, of, of where I'm, like, with my own background and, and where I come from, is there is that merit part to it, but the community-based thing is, is quite important as well. Um, how, do we, how do we, if we want to go on this journey and um, foster a sense of cultural competency, what would be your suggestion for how to begin that? Start. <laughs> Actually, like, start by having an open mind and having a conversation. We hate having conversations. We all hate having those conversations. Start. Reach out to people who work within them industries and actually work within that. I mean, David is a perfect example of that, you know. Actually, reach out to people and speak to them. Be open to um, being criticised, you know. Be open to that. Be open to learning and actually having the ability to take in information that's going to benefit you and what you want to achieve in life and, and what you want to achieve personally. Um, this is going to be around forever, so we just have to keep trying to do our best to, to keep improving it as much as we can along the way. Yeah, we just need to continue as individuals. In fact, in that um, in the video that kicked us off, you know, we we had individuals saying, "This is how I plan to start. I plan to start with me," and that's fantastic. But it also at the other end of um, uh, of things, um, David, you, you need surely empathetic leadership at the top. Yeah, I think when you when you see that on a on a daily basis, it, it certainly makes it um, far easier. And um, you know, at, from from my own um, sporting successes on the, the mini golf course, um, I do wonder if um, you know in our lifetime we may get to see one Olympics. You know, not just the Olympics and the Paralympics, but you know, is that um, are we are we thinking too big? Um, you know, or or is that the blue sky thinking that we actually we need to be really think about and working backwards from? Oh, is that where you would head to, Dame Valerie? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you, you, you've got to set your goal, like your sights up there. And like David said, work backwards, because that's the only way you, you achieve your goal, right? You set them goals and then you've got to work towards achieving them goals. You've got to set them high. If not, it's your waste of your time, everybody else's time, but it's getting that support network around you and having the right people there to make that journey happen. And it's there's going to be very uncomfortable times and days and uncomfortable, you know, situations, but you're going to have to stick to it to actually get to those Olympics. Hey, David. <laughs> yeah, keep going with that mini golf, David. <laughs> so let, let, me, let me ask you, Teresa Gatting, about leadership. You know, we talked about the notion of personal responsibility. That's a really great place to start. Um, but meeting um, that effort from here, from the top, how does that look? What does a leader need to do to foster this culture? Um, look, I agree with what um, Dame Val said about just start. And I think it's a co-creation. I used to be way more goal-oriented than I am now. I'm still quite goal-oriented, but I leave room in the spaces to come up with a new plan that's actually better than the original plan. And I just want to um, give an example of that. When, when we had our Global Woman Hui in Wellington earlier this year at Ponaki, so a couple of hundred Global Woman members in a room, and we asked um, Dame Pru Kapua, what, how can we get more Wahine Māori members? And she, with great mana, said, so we were well-intentioned, mainly white women, and she said, with great mana, well, we don't really come in onesies and twosies for a start, and we're collective, and why would we come? 
you need to come to us that we can walk hand in hand together. You need to ask, you need to think about what we're trying to achieve, how that sits alongside what you're trying to achieve, and then together we can create something. And so that's, that's stuck with me all year, stuck with me all year, really. And um, I think it's part of the answer to this. It's all very well for organisations led by white men, let's say, let's say, just to wake up and go, right, we need more of this and do more of that. Actually, but the rest of us, women and Māori, have been doing it ourselves anyway. Like Māori women run a lot of the runanga. Run, the CEOs are three of the four biggest iwi. It's not like they were waiting for their white sisters to show them the way. So it's actually quite important to think about what we're doing here as a co-creation. And our goal, our goal is for everyone individually and all organisations and our company to truly create the, the biggest impact, have the most amazing wairua, because we authentically are co-creating that which is possible when we embrace diversity. I love it. Co-creation. Thank you very much. We do have to wrap. I just want to give you each 20 seconds to give me your final thoughts. And um, Teresa, let's start with you. Your final thought um, from the back of the session. Be intentional about it. If anyone's listening on this call and thinks, right, be intentional start pick up the one or two things that where you are today can make a difference and just get going for 22. brilliant david yeah having the the um the ability to be able to execute on those plans and you know we, we saw that in the video earlier and and uh love to, to look, go back over that and have a look and actually you know what revisit this next year and uh, in fact the next year is not not um, soon enough but revisit regularly in order to be able to to um, understand that execution we're ending all too soon dame valerie your final thoughts uh be courageous be courageous to have those conversations and to reach out to trusted people who could help you start your journey Absolutely brilliant. Thank you all. Yakuranga tira tina te mehina nui. Kia koutou katoa. Dame Valerie, David Tikao, Teresa Gatting, thank you so much. Tēnā rā te mehi atu te tangi atu ki a koutou e whāre ki ana ki tēnei kaupapa māno tūnu koutou. Ko te atua e manaki e tiaki. Mauri ora and thank you everyone who has joined us for this session. It's been an absolute privilege to sit down with these incredible people and also with you to discuss uh, diversity and inclusion such a um, important uh, such an important topic for us all to be discussing and moving forward at pace um, at the moment so thank you very much everybody I'd like to thank again our session sponsor AIA and uh, invite back uh, the session sponsor Christy Redfern to close us out for this session Tēnā katoa Teresa, David, Valerie. Wow, what a thought-provoking session. My gosh, they've given us a lot to work with there. All amazing facilitation by Mariama as well to bring out those stories. Thank you for your honesty and being authentic with us today and really shining a light on diversity and inclusion. There is such an opportunity here. On behalf of AIA, we're hugely proud to sponsor this session. At AIA, we talk around doing the right thing in the right way with the right people. So this absolutely hits the mark. Thank you to all of our speakers for giving up their time today. Hugely appreciated. And let's not forget, it starts with action.
Tamotewehi, what an incredible discussion from such a range of perspectives. What a privilege to be able to gather these talented individuals together and hear what they have to say about how we can do better for the here and now and for future generations by promoting diversity and inclusion. We really are hugely appreciative of the time our speakers have made available, and we have thoroughly enjoyed hearing the views and insights. It starts with action. That's our call to arms. Embrace uniqueness and encourage everyone to get involved. Audience, what a day it's been so far, from political heavy hitters to pandemic hit tourism and diversity and inclusion hits and misses. What an amazing lineup of speakers, panelists, and hosts. Before a very brief sum up of the day so far, we have a treat from some talented students from Woodlands Full Primary School. The video was a winner in FSC's Wide as Money Matter competition. These clever rangatahi have explained their top five reasons why money matters. Why does money matter? It helps our worm farm, of course. <laughs> I thought this video was meant to be about money, not worm farming. Oh, it's so much more than that. Let us explain how our worm farm business has helped us understand why money matters. Here are our top five reasons. Goals. To achieve our goals, we use the three money jars system. The jars help us to plan where our money goes. We can see our money growing and this makes us very excited. We have learned that it's very important to not spend all our money once we get it. Instead, we have, planned, we have learned to save some of our money and that having a plan for our money is a good thing. Choices. Life is all about choices, so it's important to know the difference between a need and a want. The expenses jar pays for our needs and our saving jars pays for our wants. The worm farm needs compost hay and lime to keep it running. Our wants are more gloves, ovals and a sink with running water. Work hard. Money doesn't actually grow on trees. Instead, you have to do the mahi to earn it. You have to work for it. We have to put in a lot of mahi in order to keep our worm farm running smoothly. Here are some examples of what we have to do. Charity. Our favourite jar might just be the give jar. We have decided to save some money from each litre of one piece old. We are going to donate our money to the SPCA. It's important to help give back to our local community and support people who need it the most. We are looking forward to the end of the year when we get to visit the SPCA. We are aiming to have at least $200 in our gift jar to donate. Lifelong skill. Money is something that we will have to use for our, our lifetime, so best to start young. By learning about money, we will be able to use what we have learned now to help us when we are older. Some of us have even started our own businesses at home, like buying and selling calves, selling eggs, pine cones and canning. So that's our top five reasons why money matters. So much to love about that effort. Stand out soundbite, best to start young, from the mouths of babes. Now, reason number four, you may recall, was the give jar. That's a nice segue to our charity partner, Voices of Hope. To donate, please visit the fundraising page of the Voices of Hope website. This wrap-up will be brief, partly because the virtual experience does bring its own challenges, but also because the shoes of those who usually 
fill this role are simply too big. Rest assured, we will look to resume normal transmission from next year with the pithy and insightful raps from our usual suspects, including Mike Woodbury and David Ireland. We do hope you've enjoyed day one of the conference so far. First, we had excellent breakfast sessions. Women and supers leave no one behind. Laduka's regenerative medicine and 3D printing. And in conversation with the supervisor and trustee CEOs. In our first political keynote, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance reminded us of some of the economic fundamentals with GDP growth at 2.8% in the last quarter, unemployment at 3.4% where projections had been more than 10%. Some sure signs that New Zealand's economic future has a solid base to rebuild and regenerate from. Challenge and resilience were the Minister's key words to sum up the pandemic era. And a salutary reminder about the dire COVID mortality stats around the world, 200 plus per 100,000 of population in the UK and US, compared with seven in Australia and less than one in New Zealand. And our economic focus is on looking up and looking out to build back better and stronger. Tourism New Zealand CEO Rene Demanchi talked with Richard Clippen about tourism's plans for a big comeback to its former glory and beyond. Tourism will look to restore tourist confidence and pent up demand will play a part in the recover and rebound phase and new opportunities will need to be identified. Even while the battle against the virus goes on, countries and their governing administrations are looking ahead and planning what must be done to restart economies and help return society to some semblance of normality. Tourism is not only a key building block of our economy, it also enables us to understand other regions and cultures and is a source of great joy in many people's lives. Although the immediate impact on the industry has been extreme, with careful management and using a staged approach, the tourism sector will move into recovery and will eventually rebound. In our second political keynote, Minister David Clark reminded us that we need to serve the needs of our customers, especially during turbulent times. Trust and confidence in financial services are essential, so we need to bake in the customer's interests in all we do. We need to challenge ourselves to ask whether the actions we take are geared toward creating better outcomes and whether they build that trust and confidence in financial services. And our final keynote focused on diversity and inclusion, which despite some headwinds is making some significant inroads. Our panel of experts talked about what they are seeing and not seeing and what's coming next. The work of the FSC and all involved in this regard is to be commended and supported. And for day two, catch our breakfast sessions from 8am. Choose from FinTech, focusing on using customer data, COVID-19 and life insurance, and investments in KiwiSaver, the future of fund managers. Tomorrow, you'll be in the very capable hands of MC Floss, Yvonne Davey. On the main platform, the keynotes range from regulatory with Jeff Biscand of RBNZ to political with Todd McClay, Nationals Member of Parliament for Rotorua. You'll hear from a panel of experts on KiwiSaver 2.0 and a life insurance advice client story. And there's an inspiring closing keynote you just won't want to miss. Then later, you can catch the Sundowner sessions where there's a life insurance claims focus, a look at systems for better customer service, and a risk heat map number one hit, cyber resilience. Sponsors to you, a virtual round of applause. Thank you from all of us for your generosity. Thank you again to each of our speakers. To the FSC team, what a massive effort by a very talented bunch who have become remarkably adept at the triple pivot. Richard, thank you for your amazing stewardship as always. Trust you all have a break lined up. Finally, I'd like to remind you that at 3.30 today, there are three sundowner sessions on offer, investments in KiwiSaver, workplace savings and fintech. There's a wealth of information to hear and absorb. 
Haere rā from me, Kakiteano, Namihinui, Matewa. Mm-hmm.